Well, we are going to be back in the book of Philippians this week. Um, I feel like we, we were coming out of the, and that's just the nature of how things go and scheduling is. Um, now, we, we came out of the gate strong, continuing to go through the book of Revelation. There was, or the book, not Revelation, you see, that's my mind that I was telling you about that was going to be a little messed up today. The book of Philippians, and as we've been going through it, there's just been uh, different occasions that have popped up for us to take pause and have to go somewhere else. Um, last week was a blessing as Zach got to give a, give a message about, uh, specifically about his mission trip and also the importance about us as the local body taking uh, Christ's word out to the streets. And I think we are going to even see some of that here in this text today. So please turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, and we are going to be in verses 14 through 18 for today. So Philippians chapter 1. Verses 14 through 18, let us go ahead and pray specifically over this text before we read it. Lord God, I, I just thank you, uh, God. I thank you for the confidence that we have to approach your holy, righteous, and just being, Lord. The confidence that it comes about through knowing your Son, and God, I would just ask that today we would be given more confidence to speak of you, Lord, without any fear of anything that this world could give to us. Lord God, I, I would ask today that we would be refined to what your word has to offer, that we would not, from my mouth that were into the hearer's ears, Lord, that we would not go a step beyond what your text here has to offer for us, Lord but that we would be edified and that you would ultimately be glorified. Lord, I just say these things in your name. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Verses 14 through 18 of Philippians chapter 1. Let us read. And that most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord because of my chains, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives thinking to cause me affliction in my chains. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Let us pray over this text again. Lord God, let us rejoice here in the proclaiming of your gospel today, Lord. Let us rejoice not because of, of any sort of intellectual prowess or, or remarkable way that things might be said behind this pulpit or even in ways that things are not well said behind this pulpit as we might see, Lord. But God, that we would rejoice in your name, the name that is above all names, being proclaimed in truth and in honesty, Lord. God, let us, all of us in this room, Lord, preach you crucified not from a place of envy and strife, but from a place of goodwill, in truth, in happiness and in joy, and that through doing this, Lord, many might know who you are. Lord, we would ask this request, knowing that your will will be done in these things, and wanting and seeking that will to be done above all else, Lord. We say this in Jesus, the one whom we rejoice over. Amen. So as we have not been in this text uh, regularly in this last couple of weeks, we're going to just read verses 12 through 13 here just to help remind us of where we've come from so far. Verse 12 through 13. Now I want you to know, brothers, that my circumstances have turned out for greater progress of the gospel, so that my chains in Christ have become well known throughout the whole Praetorian guard and to everyone else. This was the last text that we've come and read through as a church here in the book of Philippians. Paul, as a reminder, is writing this 
from prison while uh, he's writing this while in prison to Rome, and he's writing this explicitly to a church that's near and dear to his heart, and that is the church of Philippi. Philippi. We must remember, as as I hope that we we would take anything that was from last week, last time that we were in this uh, text, uh, the part that I think that is most remarkable about the entire book of Philippians is something that uh, Shauna showed me as a quote from John MacArthur. And this is not a direct quote, but it is a reference to what we see in this. And it's an application that, that Paul's joy wasn't joy because he was in prison, but his joy was because he has joy in Jesus Christ. And that's a joy that he can take with him no matter what situations he's in. He can take that joy with him and apply it in a very real and meaningful way so that no, no matter what happens to him, whether he lives, it is Christ, or whether he dies, it is gain. Because he has Jesus Christ, something that no man can ever take away from you. No matter what you think you can do, the love of Christ will never leave you if you have faith in Jesus Christ. This is remarkable, and it should be something that is instilled to us as the Christian believers. That there is nothing that this world can do to you. There's nothing that your husband can give to you. There's nothing that your son or daughter can take away from you. As far as what you have in Jesus Christ, you have the very means of salvation there, and no one can take that from you, brothers and sisters. And I just want to read verse 13 again. So that my chains in Christ had become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. This, I think, is such a remarkable thing that we must remember as we continue to read in on verses, especially verses 15 through 17, those, these verses present some difficulty as the reader of this text, and there's a lot of different thought on it. And so I just hope you remember, chains of Paul are being well known throughout the entirety of the land, to the Praetorian guards and to everyone else. And so people know of the condition that Paul is in. And I think as a Christian, as, a, as just an individual, a human, we would look at that and we would say, that does not look good. It does not look appealing. Paul is, is, is suffering. This does not seem like a good thing. So let us read now verse 14, coming off of that in verse 13. Verse 14 says this, And that most of the brothers... Now I want to pause here. And talk explicitly, Paul is not talking about a, a, familiar, uh, a family relationship in the sense of his own physical brother uh, that he was born with, right? He, he's talking about the Christian church, brothers. So this is a Christian, this is a professing believer that's probably taken the sign of baptism as we just talked with, with the children here. This is, this is explicitly talking to the Christian church. And I want you to pay attention to something. He doesn't say all... My brothers, he says, most, what does it look like? How is it applied in our lives? Why would the chains of Paul produce confidence in a Christian? Because I hope that it would produce confidence in you today as a Christian that's reading over this remarkable text. I want us to consider three things that I see when I think of the confidence of Christ here in this text. Paul is not arguing for a hope of physical deterioration of society to be the hope of the Christian. There are some Christians that I've heard say, I just want things to get worse so Christ can come back. Their hope is in the world getting worse. That would be hope in something other than Christ that their hope would be in then. How many times do we see Christians fall into the absolute pit of paralysis? to share the good news in the worst of times because they have been taught to hunker down, avoid controversy, don't rock the boat. If anything is in theology, teaches us to avoid the sin-covered world so that we may avoid chains, the hardships, or be confident that my chains will be taken off of me, be confident that the world will be better, be confident that in years to come, everyone will know Christ. No, that's not what Paul says. He says, whether for me to die is gain or to live is Christ. Christ is already victorious. He doesn't say, be confident that the whole world will become Christian in this way. 
He doesn't say be confident that you might not suffer, but that their hope is not dependent upon an absence of suffering. This is important for us to realize, again, our hope, if if our hope was placed in either a physical deterioration or a physical betterment, our hope is in something other than Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm trying to direct our eyes to. That's the third thing I would like to talk about then, that I think that the confidence of Jesus is in this text. Why? Why is there confidence in the Lord correlated to Paul and his suffering? It is because while Paul is in prison, he is also in something far better. Lydia and Adventure Club herself even said it today. Rome must have been really mad that Paul and others came to know Christ. They were unwilling to bow their knee to Caesar, but they only bowed their knee to the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which is Jesus. Imagine right now, this is just an analogy, so don't take this too far, but imagine right now if your hope was set in the government of Idaho. All you can do is share Facebook posts about how great Idaho is and you think it's going to be better or it's going to be worse, whatever your hope looks like. And you think that Idaho is going to become better and better and better or more godly. Would there be confidence in the Lord if you saw Paul dragged out of the Capitol House in Boise today? If you thought that Idaho would be reformed and refined to the teachings of Paul right then and there? Or would you stop and think, well, that's not supposed to happen. I thought things were going to get better. Paul's in prison when he writes this text. Maybe, maybe you see something like that happen, a Christian get persecuted here in Idaho, and so then you go home and you just think that was just, a, that was just a random occurrence, and you go home and you turn on the news, and then you see on the news that there is an LGBTQ plus pride parade being announced and rejoiced over by the newscast. So then you think, well, I can't watch the news. Maybe I'll just go to the library instead. And there you go into the library thinking that you'll find a place to rejoice over your beloved Idaho. And you see little children running about with cheer and joy on their faces. And you think that this might be a sign of the hope that you had in Idaho and the people itself. To then peer over a crowd that has circled around a horrendous abomination called a drag queen. As they read soft porn to children... If your hope is focused on this world and you are being honest with yourself, you will lose all confidence. Confidence in the physical world will always be met by disappointment in the Christian life. Your hope has to be on something that is outside of this world. Your hope has to be on something that Paul took into prison with him. And that hope has to be that you were born again, that you've entered into a kingdom that is not of this world, a government that's far better than what Idaho or anywhere else could provide for you. That though you are in a fallen kingdom physically, there is hope only in the one that is the mediator of the new covenant as we have been made undeserving members of. That is where our hope must be at, is in members of the new covenant. And whether or not Idaho gets better or worse, if your hope is in Christ, that will change the way that you behave in this world. And hopefully, the gospel of Christ, his kingdom, will be advanced through you proclaiming that hope. A hope that is not dependent upon the outside world. Fanny Crosby, I think we've talked about her in the past as we've sung her hymns is one of the most, if not the most, prolific hymn writer in history. Though blinded by an incompetent doctor at six weeks of age, she wrote over 8,000 hymns. Wonderful, remarkable woman of the faith. She has a song, I don't know how it's sung as far as heaven. I'm going to just read this to you. Ye armies of the living God... With banner, shield, and sword, march onward, shouting as you go, No king but Christ our Lord. All crowns be on his sacred head, all worlds be at his feet, all scepters in his mighty hands, all tongues his praise repeat. 
Salvation, glory, strength, and power ascribe to him alone, whose truth established firmly, firmly stands, eternal as his throne. Untransversed regions, boundless realms, their great first cause adore, his rules and majesty supreme, and reigns from shore to shore. March on, ye victors, to his grace, to him your trophies bring. Creator, Savior, Prophet, Priest, Redeemer, Lord, and King. Sometimes I wish that a lot of the contemporary songs would only have an ounce of what Fanny Crosby would bring to the table. Rick said it today in Adventure Club. Jesus is Lord. So then, the question now must be asked, if, if Jesus is Lord and that is what we are to have confidence in, so that when chains come, we know Jesus is Lord and that's where our hope is at, why then does Paul then say, most of my brothers, not all of my brothers? This is so simple. And many of us today, and I would ask that you think about this for yourself, many of us today could be said to be guilty of this. Does the thought of an awkward conversation stop you from sharing the gospel? Does the thought of you being kicked out of your close group of friends or family even hinder you from professing Jesus as Lord? I would argue that we all fail miserably at this. And I would also say that this is the great plague that has taken over Christianity in our generation. And that is lack of of zeal in the greater hope we possess as being in the new covenant and being members of a kingdom that is not of this world. Brothers and sisters, if you think you are quick to profess Jesus, but then scatter at the shaking of the thought of the wolf coming, you will deny your master when the wolf really does come. Your kingdom, Christian, is in heaven with our Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God upon faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and brothers and sisters, listen to what Paul says here, and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Paul knew Jesus as Lord. He knew of his power, and that is the reality that he took into the very similar sufferings that he went through as a disciple of Christ. Your hope must be set upon Jesus as Lord and God if you want to have any true hope, any lasting hope in this world. One that does not shift like the sand, that does not waver like the blade of grass outside at the different, uh, different temperature and different wind that comes through this town. Was it not windy this week? I know that the people on the ranches would definitely say it was very windy these last two weeks, correct? If you are built upon the rock of Jesus Christ, may the winds, may the waters, may they all come against you. But you will not fall if you are built upon the chief cornerstone that was rejected. Brothers and sisters, I want to pray specifically over this. We're not done for today, but let us pray in this. Lord God, I would ask today, Lord, that as we read here that Paul said most of the brothers, Lord, that today in this church, we would have confidence in you, Lord, because of the chains of Paul, the suffering of Christians, the people in Haiti, the, the persecuted church in China, wherever it be, Lord, that we would have far more courage today to speak the word of God without fear in our lives, Lord. God, give us this day in this text just to live godly lives. No, no. They are also telling others about Jesus. They are proclaimers of the good news. If you think today that I don't need to ever open my mouth about Jesus, you don't profess Jesus before your neighbors. 
you don't profess Jesus before other men, then Jesus says he won't profess you before the Father. The reality is, is that the way you live is not just a way that you live with your feet in your hands and then stops at your mouth and your tongue. It's an entirety of your being that if you've been born again, the entirety of your whole person wants to proclaim Jesus as Lord. Whether it be through the way you live or the way that you talk, it has to be harmoniously tied together. There's a lot of Christians that say, well, I don't ever tell G people about Jesus, but as long as I live good, then they will know him. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that how will they know him? How will they believe if they do not hear him preach to them? You have to be willing to open your mouth. Courage to speak the word of God. Now, what does this word of God mean? What does that, what does that look like towards this first century church? This is interesting to think about because the word of God, what would it have been back then? Because we know that it's obviously not a closed canon at that time, right? They, they don't have the 66 books of the Bible like you and I have today in, on our hands. The whole book of Philippians that's in our Bible is being written to them about a time when they were able to speak the word of God to other individuals. This most likely would have been consistent of the whole entire Old Testament, as well as the teachings of the apostles at that time. I would encourage you to also take notice of this. Acts 4, 10 through 12 actually gives us an example of someone preaching the word of God. And it says in there, Let it be known to all of you, this is uh, the, the apostles that are speaking in here, Peter specifically. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He, and now notice this, this is a quotation from the Old Testament. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is, an, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, brothers and sisters, did, Paul, or did Peter in this text only quote Scripture? No, he quoted it and then he applied it properly. This is what I would argue is preaching the word of God, that we see speaking the word of God in Philippians chapter 1. I can tell you right now that when I was LDS for 19 years, do you want to know how many times I was read to from the scriptures? A lot. Did I ever have one message that actually clearly presented and applied the text to my life correctly? Not ever once. Just you thinking if I just read the text to somebody that sometimes might be enough for them to know who Christ is. But a lot of the times, it also means that you as the Christian must be able to look at these things, discern it, and say, okay, I know know how to apply it to the person that's hearing me. Did you know that out on the sign outside right now, Jesus is enough? Does, do we say amen to that? I hope we say amen to that. Do you know that's not a phrase ever found in the Bible, Jesus is enough? That's a creedal statement saying that Christ paid my sins, that I don't have to do anything else, that His atonement was enough for me. So when you go to your neighbors and you say, Jesus is enough, you might be applying biblical word of God to them properly. But you have to be able to apply the text correctly to do such. It doesn't mean that you just read the text. It means that you know the text, that you know Jesus Christ is crucified, that you can proclaim to them Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the only means of our salvation, that Jesus is enough. Very, very interesting to think about in this. And all this proclaiming, how is it to be done? How, how does the proclaiming and the speaking the word of God, how is it to be done? It says that it's supposed to be done without fear. And this goes back to the very first thing that we've been talking about here in this verse. Why could it be done without fear? It's because their hope was not set in something of this world. Their hope was set in what they were proclaiming. And that is Jesus is Lord that he has died for us and that he will come again. That my hope is only in him and what he has provided for us. That his kingdom, he reigns today and forever. 
His kingdom is not of this world. Let's read verses 15 through 17 here, and we will look at these things. And I hope that by looking at more of the broad stroke in this text that we can understand the application of verses 15 and 17. As I said earlier, there are many different commentaries and theologians that would disagree on what this text has to say here. A lot of different thought and thinking on these verses. Verse 15, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. So notice in there, there's two types of people that are being talked about. Some that are preaching Christ, envy and strife. Some that are preaching Christ from goodwill. The latter do it out of love. So the ones that are doing it from goodwill are doing it out of love. Knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel, which is, again, remarkable to think about, because Paul is saying that his current situation is for the defense of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, do you know that one of the greatest arguments that we can say about the truth of this scripture is that many people that saw the risen Christ took that testimony with them to the grave, with them to prison, with them to wherever they went. They never denied that Jesus is Lord. So did you know that this, this text still remains true for you and I today? That Paul in prison was a defense for the gospel. That's for you today. Paul went to prison not because of a make-believe story, but he went to the prison and to death because of the reality of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord, a greater hope than what anything could ever be offered to him. It's still a defense for you and I today. Just remember that. Verse 17, it says, The former proclaim Christ, Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me affliction in my chains. Now I want to pause here and think about this for a moment. Paul is not in this text saying that we ought to accept everybody willy-nilly and think that uh, if, if somebody is preaching a different gospel, a different Christ, a different Bible, a different this, a different that, that we're just to accept them. That's not what Paul is saying in here. A lot of people would look at this and wrongfully apply the text and say, oh, well, look, Joel Osteen, these bad preachers, these ones that preach a false gospel, we're just to, we're just to accept them and, and welcome them into our our. Our life. That's not, let me be clear in this, that is not what Paul is saying in this text. Why? Galatians 1, 8, 9, But if we, or an angel from heaven, should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. Paul is very clear that if somebody preaches a false gospel, they're to be cut off, kicked out, rejected. That you're not to accept somebody that proclaims a false gospel. So then why does it say in here that some preach it from and V and strife, some preach it from love and goodwill. Well, the reality of this is, is that both of these types of individuals are proclaiming a true gospel. Both of them are in Christ, and that is why Paul can say, yes, I will rejoice. I rejoice that these people are still proclaiming Christ. Now consider this. Imagine now if today you were in a... Uh, let's say you were in that day of Paul, and you were a preacher. Let's just imagine this for a moment. Jealous and envious of what Paul has, and how many people are following him. A person like that could still proclaim the truth of the gospel, but have wrong motives set behind what they're trying to now do. And so now they've taken advantage of where Paul's at, because where's Paul at? He's in prison. So somebody might be able to say in that day, well, you see, I told Paul that he shouldn't be as contentious as what he was, so you should actually follow me because, look, I'm not in prison. Paul's in prison, so come follow me. That would be preaching Christ out of envy and strife rather than preaching Christ out of goodwill and love. Come follow me. Paul's in prison. I'm not. I'm obviously the person that you ought to be following as a, as a, as a believer. We see that even in the New Testament. Some follow Apollo. Some follow Paul. That, that was, this is a common thing that men fall into, is trying to follow a certain individual rather than Jesus Christ. And so this would just be a, a, a point of, of remembrance for you and I as Christians. Let me, let me read this, because there was something I really wanted to make a point in this. That, um, I might have lost my place, I apologize for that. Um, the point of this, though, is, brothers and sisters, that you and I can disagree with other churches, other Christian churches that are orthodox. 
that are, believe Jesus Christ and who he is according to the Bible. But let's say they have a different view of ecclesiology, the makeup of the church, the function of the church than you do. They have a different view of even, let's say, administration of baptism. They have a different view of eschatology. All these different things that we talk about in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, these people could have different views than what you yourself hold to. And I disagree with those people daily. I, I debate these kind of people daily in them. But guess what? I call them brothers and sisters in Christ regardless because they proclaim the same Christ that you and I do. And this is important for us to understand that if the essential of Christianity is not denied, then you are to call these people brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can think to yourself and you can argue, well, I think they have wrong motives. They don't, they're, they're not viewing the scripture consistently or whatever you want to say. But do not ever think that you then ought to cast over them the shadow of, well, you are to be anathema, accursed, cast out. That's not what's being said in here. This is actually a text that I think shows a lot of grace. That in the day of Paul, the people that were preaching saying, hey, look, Paul's in prison and I'm preaching Christ out of envy and strife, but it's still the same Christ, it's still the same gospel. Paul's saying what? Yes, I rejoice. It's okay. They do it for wrong motives, but they're preaching the same Christ that has saved me. They're preaching the same Christ that has saved them. But think about this, too. This, this, this goes so against what we as, as, as prideful humans want to do in life. And that is to, to cast someone down and have people look at you as the superior. We do that all the time. Do we not see that in, in, in business, in workplaces, that there's gossip and drama and hardship and negative thinking about somebody that might be maybe in a position that's higher than yourself? And so you want to lower them so that you can look better. Paul is arguing here is that if they do not deny the Christ, then that still ought to be rejoiced over is that they're preaching Christ. Now, now, let us be also clear in this. The envy and strife that is spoken of in here, is that sin? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's wrong. Paul's not saying that we should allow for exception for somebody to preach wrong, uh, wrongly in, in the sense of having not good intentions. Brothers and sisters, today is a great day to think about that in yourself. Do I ever do something or behave in a certain way or proclaim Christ in a certain manner or do something X, Y, and Z and my motives are off? If your motive is not centered on giving glory to God, edifying your brothers and sisters, advancing his kingdom and calling sinners to repentance, then your motive is incorrect. You might be saying the exact same words as the person that might have better, pure motives, but you ought to check yourself right then and there and see that you are to preach from pure places. Verse 18. This is something, again, I think we need to rejoice over. What then? So this is now, he's talking about the people that are outside of the prison that are preaching their betterment of their situation. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Brothers and sisters, again, if you disagree with brothers and sisters in Christ, rejoice over their proclaiming of the gospel. There are many uh, denominational differences between your pastor and the pastor down the road and the pastor down that road and the pastor down that road. And even from, uh, from a more global perspective, I disagree with a lot of other Christian brothers and sisters out there. And I think that they don't always have the best motives. That does not negate them from being your brother and your sister in Christ. There's, there's some theological frameworks out there today that put a heavy emphasis into evangelism. And I think that their heavy emphasis in evangelism, though that is great and wonderful, and I rejoice over their proclaiming of the gospel, I think sometimes it's done not out of the best motives. And so I would tell that person, I do tell these people, you need to check what you're doing it for, and remember what you're preaching of, and that is what you're doing it for. 
And then regardless of what the result is, then Christ is being glorified. And I don't want to beat around the bush too much on that, but that's the reality of what I'm trying to get at in here, is that we must rejoice that Christ is proclaimed always. If somebody that you disagree with out there, whether they have a different understanding of who wrote the book of Hebrews, has been a topic that we've talked about in the book of Hebrews, or whether you think that Melchizedek the priest was a pre-incarnate Christ, or you think he was a physical, literal person, you better rejoice that Christ is being proclaimed. These are things that we can disagree about, and we can do this happily and joyfully. But as long as, as heterodoxy is not being taught, and when I mean heterodoxy, I mean outside of orthodoxy, a denial of Jesus as Lord, a denial of the virgin birth, a denial of the essentials of Christianity, you ought to rejoice that brothers and sisters are preaching Christ crucified. So in this, brothers and sisters, I would let us, let us just pray as fellow individuals that are equally in the covenant of grace, that are equally been covered by Jesus Christ, let us lift up praise to him right now in the form of prayer. Uh, Lord God, I, I do, Lord, I thank you for this text here, God. Lord, I, I would ask today, Lord, that any of us, myself included, anybody that wasn't able to make it here to today's service, Lord, God, that we would look at what our motives are for doing something. Whether it be in service, whether it be in speech, whether it be in family, whether it be in parenting, whether whatever it would be, Lord, that whatever our motives are, that we would think about these things. And if they're not centered upon the hope that our confidence is to be in, Lord, that we would cast those things away. Lord, I would also ask too, Lord, specifically that our confidence in you would be strengthened so that we would preach the word of God without fear, Lord. That we would live not only godly lives, but we would pronounce godly realities to our neighbors, to our physical brothers and sisters, to our other members here in this church, that we would rejoice in Christ being proclaimed, Lord. Lord, I would ask today that as we sing our last song, that we would all say in our minds, yes, and I will rejoice. And let us sing this final hymn, Rejoicing. And we say this in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please.